I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Jonah chapter 4. Put this here. Uh, we are finishing up Jonah today. And uh, there's some wonderful things in the text which Devin actually already alluded to. I'm going to read it here in just a moment. As you do that, let me, let me say a couple other things. Uh, Dave said this in the announcements. Oh, you know what we forgot? So Leon was praying for the, uh, the, the, in our congregational prayer. And you may or may not have heard that he is again another a grandpa. That Carrie Lynn, did I get the right one? Carrie Lynn had a baby girl. And I understand unnamed. Is that true? Still unnamed? Does anybody know anything I don't know? Okay. So there were some excited uh, siblings here today. And um, I'm not sure when she's coming home, but all things went well yesterday. I understand. Um, tonight, Dave said this, but we would really, we'd love you to come back. There are, uh, there's just lots happening. And so we call it a members meeting. That just means if you're not a member, you can't vote. And that is a significant step. But I want to, I want to say this. If this is your church, so I think in the bullet it says members meeting, family meeting. Sometimes you've got to get around the table. There's a lot of things to talk about. And we can't talk about everything on a Sunday morning, but there's, there's a lot of really good things going on. I, I think I heard that the two weeks of daybreak has been like near record numbers um, that have taken place. And a lot of you have invited friends. It's their first time in this church, many of them first time in church. That's, so there's incredible things happening. You will hear ministry updates. Uh, I think there are seven people that near the end of that meeting will be giving what we call a testimony, telling of God, from membership, but it just there's a lot of really awesome things. A few things we'll vote on. Just love for you to come back at six. All right, now to Jonah four. I think we titled this, Do You Do Well to Be Angry? It's actually a question God asked twice in this text, so we should pay attention to it. If you haven't been here, let me just give you just a little bit of review. Jonah is a prophetic book. Um, a prophet is um, a person who's received this message from God they're meant to deliver to the people. So in most prophetic literature, what we're paying attention to is the message delivered. In this case, Jonah is a bit unique because it doesn't focus so much on the message. He does receive a message from God. He is prophetic. He is a prophet. But it, this book focuses on the messenger, the person, Jonah. And in particular, it focuses on him because he doesn't exactly respond well to this message. Sound familiar? And so what we see in this, in effect, is is Jonah's heart. That is what is exposed, particularly in chapter 4, and we recognize that whenever a person's heart is exposed, that's meant to show us things about ourselves. So when we read this, we should be reading and listening that way. One of the great themes in this book, which comes out again in this chapter, is that God's sovereignty is everywhere, and that is meant to encourage us. So all books in the Bible, and, and this one, is telling us many things about God and many things about us. And we just want to listen well today. Now, the surprise of, of last week, of chapter 3, is, as, as Devin said earlier, there was a city-wide repentance of the people. And as we observe that, we know that that was a specific act of God and his mercy. Could God do that again? An entire city? Oh, yeah. And he has in human history. Um, in my notes, I have many noted. I'm going to skip it just because of time, but you can think them. In history, he has. In some of our lifetime in the early 70s, we caught whispers of something that wasn't quite, but was definitely a movement of God. Well, the chapter 4 contains a different kind of surprise, and that's this. It is Jonah's reaction, which may be the main point of this book in some ways. And this is one of two books in the Bible which ends with a question. It's God's question. So that means it's a rhetorical question. For when God is asking something, it's not like he doesn't know. It's actually a statement of profound truth. And we'll try to rest on that just a bit. So here's a bit the flow. The four things we'll look at today. Jonah's anger, which in this case we can tell it's at God. It's in those verses. Then we'll just note briefly God's character. Interestingly enough, um, God's character is noted in the accusation form by Jonah himself. Uh, we will then look at the plant parable and the final question. So if you would do this, let's stand as we give our attention to the reading of God's word. We're reading chapter 4. I'm going to read one verse from chapter 2. It's when Jonah's in the belly of the whale. Verse 9. I'm going to read that first, 
And then we'll read chapter 4. You'll understand it when I read it, why I do so. Here's Jonah, in the belly of the whale, apparently repentant. He says, chapter 2, verse 9, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will repay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And God grants repentance to a city in chapter 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. And the Lord God appointed a plant, made it come up over Jonah that it might shade, be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. And when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die, and said, It is Better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. Note the tone. Probably true. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. Let's pray as we stand. God, teach us. Teach us about your heart, your desire, and teach us about ours and where they need to be justed. There is no one standing here, God, that stands guiltless before you in terms of our actions. The only way that can be so is when we stand under the blood of Christ. It's only because of your mercy that we could even talk to you now. We thank you for it. But God, we need you. Every single one of us walks into this building today with great need. We're not even aware of how much. So speak to us, God. And I, we ask this. Jesus said it many times. God, give us ears to hear you. And then respond. Thank you. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to do this fairly quickly today. So I want you to have your seatbelts on. Listen well. Here's here's the first thing. We see Jonah's anger in verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. What chapter 4 does, it brings Jonah's anger right to the center stage. It's verse 1, it's verse 4, it's verse 9. He is angry with how God has shown mercy upon Nineveh. It is a kind of self-righteous anger. He is also angry when this plant disappears. The plant is something that God provided, something that Jonah has come to love. Now it's gone. And he's angry. Jonah's anger leads to what we would call irrational thoughts. He says twice, it is better for me to die. In fact, I'm angry enough to die. That's irrational. You ever get angry and call these crazy thoughts? Jonah is angry with whom? He's angry with God. And why is he angry with God? Well, it's because God, he doesn't like what God is doing. I want us to think about that for a moment. I want us to think a little bit about anger and even anger towards God because I'm not sure that we are always aware of our anger towards God if we're aware of anger at all. When there's something that has happened, and I don't like how it has happened, 
there's often a low level, or maybe large level, of anger. It just comes out in some kind of way. It's actually pretty common. It's one of the themes in this book. Well, interestingly enough, here's a parallel theme. is that God's sovereign hand is involved in everything. You can't, you can't read this book and escape that. It's true in the wind. It's true in the storm that God sent after him. It's true in the fish that the Lord appoints. It's true in a citywide turning. It's true as we read it here how the Lord appoints a, a plant, a worm, and then a scorching east wind. So for those of us who would understand that God is in control, that he is sovereignly involved in everything, what happens when something goes differently than we would like? Or, what happens within us when something goes differently than we think is best? Goes on all the time, doesn't it? Didn't that happen all the time? Don't have to think too far. What is our reaction? Frustrated? I'm frustrated. What is frustration? Frustration, it's, it's low-level anger. We just don't want to call it that. It is. It's low-level anger. Angry at whom? That question stopped me a couple times. It's, you know what, it's, can I just say it's way easier to listen to this than have to preach it? Because you had, to, you, you, had to, you had to think about this text for a long time all week. I stopped a bunch of times this week. Realizing then, because I do believe that the Scripture teaches that God is in control of all, then my frustration, really low-level anger, is actually against God. That should create a pause in us, should it not? When something goes on that we didn't like or something goes on that we didn't think was best. Now in Jonah's case, his anger is directed at something God does which he cannot understand and of which he disapproves. That is God's pardoning of Nineveh. That's one of Israel's great enemies. It's like, God, do you know what they are like? Do you know what they deserve? How could you spare them? I knew you would. I knew that you are gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in love, relenting from disaster. There's a sense where he's he's attacking God's character, but it's the very things that Jonah has received. Jonah wants to determine where God's mercy will fall. That's not our job ever. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So for some people... Anger is what keeps them from God. And that'd be my question. Is that true for you? Is anger keeping you from God? Is it? There are a lot of things that happen in this world that I don't understand. I don't understand child abuse. Many of us here have experienced that firsthand in some way. I don't understand cancer. That's known here in this congregation Tragic deaths. There's a lot of things we don't understand. Why? Why her? Why him? We probably won't hear the answer, at least not one that we would understand, as if we could demand an answer from our Creator God. Listen to me closely. I, I don't think it's wrong to have such questions, but some people allow this why question to become a demand against God that actually keeps them from God. Please don't let that. I I beg you, please don't let that. Do not let your why questions turn into a demand against God that keeps you from God. It morphs into some kind of anger and creates a wall. I'm angry at God! Angry enough to die! That is, they stay angry at God and therefore distant from him. It's not that hard to see ourselves in Jonah, is it, actually? So how did, how did the Lord answer Jonah? It's a, it's a really interesting answer. I mean, do you remember how he confronted Jonah's anger? I'm going to put a clay plot, pot there. It was, was Jonah's response this, excuse me, was God's response this way to Jonah? Who are you, Jonah, to tell me what to do? Is that what he said? Nope. 
He could have. He could have said, what right does the clay pot have to say to its maker, to the potter, to the one who formed it? Why did you make me for this use and not some other use? God could have said that, right? He does, in fact, in Romans 9. It's true. It's not what God says here to Jonah. Or was God's answer more this way? Because Jonah was indicating that he knew better than God. Did, did God say to him, Jonah, where were you when I formed the oceans and the dry land? Huh? Where, where were you when I set the planets in motion around the sun and, and rotated the earth to give us day and night? Where were you, Jonah? Where, where were you, Jeff? Are we the ones to give God advice and be his instructor? You recognize that? That's actually the Lord's word in the last few chapters to Job. God, God could have said that to Jonah. But it, it's interesting. That's not how the Lord answers Jonah. He certainly could have. But here in Jonah chapter 4, we see a different aspect of God's character being revealed. He says, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Twice he says that. that Jonah, that, that's good for you? That's God's kindness, is it not? That's his patience with Jonah. How many times could God ask us that? So what I've done here, in a sense, is illustrated in two types of ways, and there's many, but I just illustrated two types of anger towards God. The first one is, is for the person who does not yet have a relationship with God because of some things that have happened in the past, and they've allowed that anger to keep them from God as if it has become a wall. If that should be you, let me just say this to you. That the very fact that you are angry at him means that you do believe that he exists. Do you do well to be angry at God? I would say to you, that's God's question to you. He's saying it to Jonah. The obvious answer is no. You are worse off for it. The very one that you are angry at is the very one that you need. And you're like a little kid pouting over here, and you're going to experience all the, all the just wrath of God against your rebellion against him eventually one day. I would urge you, don't let your anger keep you from God. Just confess it. Talk to him about it. Confession is simply, it's talking to God honestly and agreeing with him. You don't have to understand everything, but don't let it be that for you. Bring it to him, all your pain, all your questions. He's big enough for it. He knows them. Do that. The second way I illustrated anger is for those who do have a relationship with the living God, they do believe that God is control, yet there is something that has happened to you that you don't like or you don't think was best. Interesting that the scriptures we read in that spoke of God's all over and God's goodness. But something's happened that you don't like, you don't think is best, and, and within you there is a low level of frustration, anger, that's what that actually is, and if you believe in God's sovereign working, then it's ultimately anger at God. Do you do well? Do you do well to be angry? I've been confronted by that question this week, and I've had to pause and confess, asking God to change my heart. It's right here in the text. Second thing we see. It's God's character. It's in verse 2. It's interesting the way this comes up to us is actually Jonah's, Jonah's accusation. And I love this because God doesn't change. So he's accusing God of being this way. Jonah's actually received the benefit of God this way, even in the plant, you know, even in the belly of the fish. We receive this. And he says, For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Yes, amen. <laughs> That's him. That's our hope. And you can read it again and again in scriptures. If you've got footnotes, it'll probably show up in Exodus 34, 6. Psalm 86 will be there. The one I want to read is Joel chapter 2. And Joel chapter 2 is the prophet. Israel has been apostate. Israel's in trouble. And Joel uses the same phrase. It's a description of God. The same words that he's, he's appealing. You've got to come back to him now, is what he says. Joel chapter 2. 12. 
through 14. Yet even now declares the Lord, this is the Lord's invitation, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. You know how when they would, Nineveh, when it, when it humbled itself, they were tearing their clothes, wearing sackcloth. He said, tear your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord, your God. Why? For he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. That's our God, amen? (laughs) That is him. That's our hope. And Jonah's ticked that God is like that because Jonah doesn't like it when God has mercy on the very people that Jonah despises. Salvation belongs to the Lord. God is going to teach Jonah with God-like patience. Third movement is the plant parable that we see 5 through 10. Probably not the same kind of plant. But I will put it there. That's our little shade plant. And so when you read this, it's kind of like, you know, maybe Jonah thinks that he's been persuasive here. He thinks God's going to listen to his arguments. So he, he goes up on this hill to wait and to watch and to see if God will do something. And he, he builds this little shelter with sticks to keep the sun off. And then verses 6, 7, and 8 uses very, very specific language. It says, the Lord appointed. It's the, the shade tree, the plant, the worm, the scorching east wind. And what we have is God in his patience is ready to give Jonah a profound object lesson in about 24 hours. And it's a lesson about God. And us. So the plant grows up, provides a, a wonderful shade. And I don't know if you've ever been on a really hot day someplace and you are just looking for shade anywhere. I heard someone tell me Sawyer Bash is like that this year. I mean, people are just going wherever they can to find shade. And you find it. So Jonah's got the shades there. And it's like, oh, I love this shade. I love this plant. And they're just like, oh, this is so good. And when day two comes, the sun's not even up yet. And this worm wakes up and goes and eats through the stalk of that plant where all the juices are flowing and the thing is dying. As the sun comes up, the thing, it's got no moisture. It's it's shriveling up. And that thing shrivels up fast. And then this scorching east wind, they call it a shirako, comes in. They know that in the Mideast. And it comes out. It makes people just crazy. It's hot. and It's nothing like we've experienced. It's brutal. Plant's dead. And Jonah's anger is rekindled. Jonah had once again experienced the kind mercy of God. Once in the belly of the fish when Jonah could have drowned for his rebellion against God. He's experienced it now in a plant. And God actually let him enjoy that plant for a season. Then he took it away. And once again, Jonah is angry. Angry enough to die. And God says to him, Do you do well? Be angry at the plant. Can you you get the tenderness of God in this? Just asking a question. Reminds me of him coming to Adam and Eve in the garden. Where are you? He knew where they were. He's engaging in this case. Jonah, you were you were compassionate about a plant. A plant. Should I not be compassionate about this city? Well, here's where Jonah is right in one sense. God's mercy is unfair, is it not? It's not fair as we actually measure fairness. I mean, this was a notoriously evil people. It's not fair that they should all of a sudden repent and be forgiven. Right? Not fair. It's not forgiven that this guy at the very end of his life, he's done whatever he's done, but he's on a cross next to Jesus, and right at the end when he's next to Jesus, he encounters the Son of God, and he apparently repents in terms of his his conversation's different than the guy on the other side. That's, that's fair? No. But here's where Jonah's wrong. It's not fair for God to forgive any of us. This was in Leon's prayer, I think. He talked about how we, we have not loved God as we should. We've, we've never cared for God as much as we should. Not really. And the danger is that people who go to church, however often that is, that we can think we deserve something good. Because we've been doing what God wants us to do. That's a danger. Do you know that? We don't deserve God's mercy 
more than anybody because of being here. But God, once again, has shown his kindness by providing the shade plant, and that plant is just simply a picture of God's undeserved mercy. He says, you pity the plant for which you did not labor or make it grow? One of the things that should, if you listen to this, there's a little whisper into the New Testament. It's that Matthew 18 parable at the end. The the servant who's been forgiven so much who can't forgive others. And one of the ways our hearts are meant to be stretched is our compassion for others needs to expand to the level of God's compassion toward us. And Jonah's living this out for us. The final question is in verse 11. What's the point of that final question? Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also a lot of cattle? It's a question, but it's rhetorical, isn't it? God's asking it and everyone knows the answer. God's really making a statement. The statement is, Jonah, you fell in love with the plant, a plant that lasted only 24 hours. You were happy with it. But By the way, Jonah, I, I created the plant. You actually didn't have anything to do with that plant, but you loved it, and you were mad when it was destroyed. Why aren't you mad that the people of Nineveh could be destroyed? Why would you have compassion toward that plant and not toward people? These people have not grown up around the Scripture They've not grown up around the revelation of my word. They don't know it. They don't know their right hand from their left. And you care more about that plant than you do these lost people. Busted? Anybody? I am. I am. Do you ever care about anything more than lost people? Something God gave you? All the time. We could have attach ourselves to these guys you know it's good it's something God gave us we'll care more about that and care more what happens to that we do about lost people it's pretty profound here in this in this the way that lands for us most of us stand as guilty as Jonah I do God cares about the lost way more than I do And when you think about Jesus' very words, who he came for, what he came to do, you think about his actual words and his life, we stand that way. Think about what Jesus says about hell. Hell's not very popular anymore. It just isn't. Um, I brought this. We we read this, um, Francis Chan. I'd recommend it. It's downstairs in the library. I, I think it's on the book table. Um, Francis Chan wrote a book called Erasing Hell, which I would, I just recommend it. It's a really easy read. But he just goes, because hell's really got on the back burner, it's really kind of like, an, an, I don't know, certain churches, they want to they wanna, they wanna de-emphasize it as if it doesn't exist. Some of us would, would acknowledge it exists, but don't want to talk about it. It's an uncomfortable subject, is it not? Who likes talking about that? But it is a reality. Reading that this summer was really helpful to to. Um, remind me of the reality, what I already believe and know what Scripture teaches. So he'll go through those things. But it, it became vivid for me again, which is really important. Particularly, it has shaped me as I live in a different city now. And I think and pray for people a certain way. I, I see the realities of that differently right now. It's easy to not. Because, you know, life, life's got a lot of trouble in it, so it's really be easy to be compressed with everything in your life and care about that plant more than lost people. It is true. God will show his mercy wherever he chooses. But we are vessels of his mercy, undeserved. Who is more undeserving? It's not for us to answer. It's for God to answer. And what if God chooses to grant mercy to the more undeserving because it magnifies his grace and mercy? I was struck Wednesday by how little I think this way and how many things that I care about, that is, I think about more than I do lost people. Salvation, 
belongs to the Lord. I'm going to close this way, talking to two different groups of people. And it, the first one's this. That if you belong to the Lord, then here's the thing. We should care about the things he cares about. We should. And in Matthew 18, when it goes through that parable, it, it's that, that aspect of how much this one guy has been forgiven, and he can't forgive someone else who owes him a debt. I, I'm going to talk about differently than, than how much forgiven. That's how much compassion of the Lord, his mercy and kindness that we've experienced. Ours is meant to expand to that level. We're to give it that way to people. If we're recipients of it, it is, we magnify him by doing so. And that is really, really hard in the stuff of life. Really hard. Because sin happens to us. In, 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 a, in a group this size, it's happened in lots of places. People come in here bearing very real hurts. And if I've gotten to the point where I'm angry about it, then what? My anger is really at who? That person, because I don't like, is God not involved? That's the whole point of this book. Every single thing comes underneath God's sovereign care. There are real sinners that live on this planet. The only chance we have is that these sinners become submitted to this Savior because we all need this Savior. And we're all undeserving of this mercy. That's why we say it's, it's level ground at the foot of the cross. So I'd say to us, if you're holding on to one of these hurts and it's whatever it is, could be in your marriage, workplace, any place, do you do well to be angry? That's, that's, that's the Lord's question. Do, do you do well? We want to care about the things the Lord cares about. And we want to be this plan, that's why I brought this, not the same one, but just it reminds me, I don't want to be loving this thing more than loving and compassion about lost people. The last person is, if you are yet to follow Christ, you are still a non-Christian, yet to believe. Let me just ask you, why? Now, there are lots of reasons why people might have a why, but one common one is this. If there's something in the past that you've let become a wall, something that you did not understand or something that you don't like, and it's become even a subtle anger, I want you to hear the Lord's question. Do you do well to be angry? For that question is actually an invitation to you to lay it down, to come to our Father in heaven with all the pain and whatever questions and bring them to him. For he is gracious and merciful, patient, in abounding and steadfast love. Let's pray. Lord, only you know each heart here. You know the spot where we are. You know where we are with you or not. And God, so I pray it this way. I pray that you would deliver your mercy and kindness to us today. And in a few moments, Lord, I pray that you will deliver it down in New Buffalo as well. And that you would do these things for your glory and our good. Thank you that you speak. Thank you that your word comes alive. Thank you that you do not leave us alone. Thank you for being God. And thank you that salvation belongs to you.